She's a lost soul. Nobody knows who she is. We take care of the dead. That's part of being a Catholic. We, didn't, we buried her like we would do any. Like poor people, if they don't have the money, we bury them. When you went to the grave for the first time, what did you say to your mom? <laughs> <sighs> I told her I loved her. And uh, um, it's when really everything sat in. A brutal, brutal crime. There was a nude female with a blunt force trauma to her head. It almost uh, decapitated from the injuries. Uh, both of her hands were cut off. You wonder who would do something so brutal to another human being. Brutally murdered in a beautiful place. It was the height of the tourist season, July 26, 1974, when a killer stunned a summer sanctuary and the dunes of this small seaside town at the tip of Cape Cod became a crime scene. It's a community where everybody sort of gets along and they all like each other. It's always been diverse. The murderer and victim were unknown for years. So without knowing who the victim is, we are already behind the eight ball in any investigation, especially one in 1974. And decades later, the crime collides with a son's lifelong search for his biological mom. It just hurts. My name is Rachel White, and I was born in Provincetown spent my life here growing up here when they found out the fashion that she was found in how she was found it caused a great deal of alarm not only because of the problem of the murder but also because it was the beginning of another summer season and the town depends on tourism for their livelihood tourists flock to provincetown each summer for its beaches history, arts, and welcoming community. The dune shacks speckled along the national seashore are tranquil spots for families to gather and for artists to work their craft. It was in the weeks following the celebration of the annual blessing of the fleet when the murder near one of those shacks shook the community to its core. Uh, area, very quiet, quaint community. So that something like this was very out of the ordinary, especially such a savage crime. In 1974, I was working in the town manager's office and i that's where I was when the Lady of the Dunes mystery was discovered. Truthfully, it was horrific. And to think that something like that could happen in this little wonderful town. It's very scary when something like that happens because we didn't even lock our doors in those days. A killer was on the loose. And even weeks after the crime, local and state investigators still didn't know who the victim was. The sands of time shifting in this mystery from weeks to months and eventually years. The dark secrets of what happened in Provincetown that day remained buried for 48 years in the back corner of St. Peter's Cemetery, where the woman known only as the unidentified female murdered in the Race Point Dunes was laid to rest. So whenever I was out there, I'd go to her grave just to make sure everything was still settled there in, uh, say, a prayer. So you visit a lot of people. Oh, God, yeah. Other people would see the, the grave saying it was an unknown person, would leave like beach glass, they would leave little dry flowers or little trinkets and stuff. Never mind not knowing who the killer was, you didn't know who this victim was for almost 50 years. Right. For any investigation, that's the key. Uh, not knowing who she was at that time, already handcuffed investigators. My name is Elisa Metcalf, and my sister, at 12 years old, discovered the Lady of the Dunes. There's my dad and my sister. My sister liked to fish too. Elisa Metcalf's parents and sister Leslie, who died in 1996, were walking through the Race Point Dunes on their way to the Seascape Dune Shack that fateful day. So that day, my parents and my sister went out to the dune shack to hang out with friends. And one of the dogs followed them part of the way. And 
veered off and started barking. My sister was curious what it was barking at and she followed the dogs and she saw this body. I mean, at first she didn't know it was a body. She said she thought it was a deer just by the, the coloring. I guess that's what your mind thinks when you're out in the dunes, that it would be some kind of an animal. But then when she looked closer, realized it was, it was a human body. The horror is forever memorialized in her father's small red journal. After breakfast, I cycled to the bank and got bait and fishing supplies. Later, Sal and I schlepped across the dunes to the dune shack. Beach, fished a bit, nothing. Then Sally, Leslie, and I walked back through the dunes. Dog barking, Leslie found woman's body. The killing troubled Jean Cohen, the owner of the Seascape Shack. In letters now in the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art, Cohen drew this map of the scene when she wrote to artist Marcia Marcus, who stayed in the shack each summer. She wrote about a torn window screen around the time of the murder, footprints found in the sand, and the possibility of the body being brought from Boston and dumped in the dunes to hide it from police. This is something you would never expect. No, I mean, we were from New York City, so, you know, we were not sheltered kids. It just seemed so uncharacteristic for Provincetown that it never occurred to us that the murderer would have been anything but some transient. And then, you know, the, the inability to identify that the woman, that the woman was not a local and nobody even knew who she was. We're uh, in the uh, dunes of Provincetown. Always felt like a very safe place and still does. Josiah Mayo has been navigating the dunes and taking care of the shacks out here since he was a boy. How do people get in here? You gotta drive, you know, it's four wheel drive territory. The sand's real soft, so you need to, to air down. So four wheel drive or walk? Yep, pretty much. The winding sandy paths in a picturesque setting lead out to the scene of the crime. By the seascape dune shack. Mm -hmm. Yep, sort of near race point. It's kind of remote, but it's right there. I mean, it's a 10, 20 minute walk from, from the highway. You know, my own sense would be that she was killed there, that the body wasn't brought out there. Michael O'Keefe was the longtime district attorney on the Cape. It would be very difficult to do that, to carry a body out to that area that was already uh, dead. This is the original um, autopsy report. Yes. Blue jeans, blue kerchief, green beach towel. The victim was found about 800 feet away from the seascape dune shack in a clump of pine growth, nude and lying face down on a blanket with her head resting on a neatly folded pair of jeans. Her skull was crushed, her head nearly severed, and her hands were cut off in a crude fashion. Size 10 footprints, possibly those of her killer, were found in the sand. There had been some tire tracks and foot impressions Police sent a description of the victim out over teletype to the FBI and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Her dental charts were shipped to dentists all across the state. We would constantly get requests thinking that families who had lost someone along the way was the Lady of the Dunes. The skull was sent, I believe, in 1993 for a facial reconstruction to get the word out that if you have a missing relative that looked like the Lady of the Dunes, then contact the state police. This is a computer facial uh, reconstruction. We have old documents from over the years that have been collected and categorized. The book of possible victims. A lot of names and faces. Huh? Yep. Evidence boxes are filled with reports, crime scene photos. So she'd been covered with a like a beach towel mm -hmm. that okay. was kind of covering her upper Part. and logs of all of the vehicles and drivers who traveled through the dunes during the weeks leading up to the gruesome discovery. By date, name, where they lived, registration. And the chief of police really had a serious situation here and he knew it. He became so obsessed with this because it happened on his watch. My name's James J. Meads Jr. My father was the police chief in charge of the uh, murder of the dunes. This is a good picture of all of us at Finland. He just never let it go. 
Chief Meads worked tirelessly trying to find the true identity of the Lady of the Dunes and to track down her killer, even traveling with her skull in this duffel bag looking for any information to help crack the case. It's basically, he put her skull in there and, and took it to different places trying to figure out who she was. He was all over the state, all over the country, outside of the country, trying to get help from, from different people. Just never, never stopped looking. He would always approach the, the next police chief and, and offer his input and, and help in any way he could. Her body was exhumed three times for DNA, but still no leads. Police eyed possible suspects from mob boss Whitey Bulger to serial killer Haddon Clark, who even confessed to the murder but wasn't involved at all. I'm Meredith Lober. I just retired as the detective supervisor of the Provincetown Police Department. Um, Warren Tobias. I'm retired from the Provincetown Police since 2009, and uh, I spent 35 years there. Well, something like this really reverberated through the community, and people were frightened. You, you know, I mean, Murders just don't happen in small towns like that on Cape Cod. This case has been in such a part of its lifeblood, almost its identity. Provincetown is the home of the Lady of the Dunes, and it always had such a lure. Who was she? Was she a girlfriend of Whitey Bulger? Was she a showgirl from New York City who was hooked up with a mob boss? you know, this mysterious person found in the dunes of Provincetown. Very frustrating, you know, I'd, I'd find something that looked promising, follow it to its end, and something like that could take months and months following one particular lead, and then it doesn't pan out. And I remember saying to myself more than once, back at square one, here we go again. For decades. Mm -hmm. The Lady of the Dunes was the longest unidentified murder victim in the state of Massachusetts. The case was unresolved for 48 years. Physical evidence from the scene, including the victim's clothing and a blanket, were thrown away by state police. But as time passed and hope faded, science and DNA analysis evolved, finally giving investigators the break they needed. It wasn't until uh, you know, we partnered with the FBI and we were able to utilize their unique capabilities in the area of investigative genealogy that we were really able to further the investigation and get the critical break that we needed, which was a name. We have identified the oldest unidentified homicide victim in Massachusetts, known as the Lady of the Dunes. She is Ruth Marie Terry from Tennessee, it would be 48 years after her murder when science and a piece of the victim's skull finally helped put a name on that gravestone and gave a family the answers they had been searching for for decades. What would your dad think? That all the hard work paid off. And with that identification, the case blows wide open. Yes. Talk about that moment when, when you got word after all this time is what you want to do as an investigator at all times. And when we finally were able to give her name, uh, Trooper Dunphy and I believe five other troopers immediately got on planes and flew down to Tennessee and to Detroit where she had different family members. Sorry. It's okay, it's okay. It's at that moment that Richard Hanchett's hopeful journey to find his biological mother ends in heartache and decades of emotion flow. A horrible thing happened to my mom in a beautiful place. Richard is Ruth Marie Terry's only child, but he never met his mom, and his dreams of reuniting with her one day were forever washed away in the dunes here. At the age of 64, after a phone call and meeting with the FBI, he learned his mom was the unidentified victim known only as the Lady of the Dunes. Had you ever heard about the Lady of the Dunes? No, I'd never heard any of it, nothing. I'm still shocked when I type Lady of the Dunes in on the command line on the PC. It just goes on for pages and pages and pages. She was a beautiful person and I wish I could have got to know her, you know, so bad. Ruth Terry was born in a mountainside shack in the small mining town of Whitwell, Tennessee. Her father worked as a coal miner. She was the youngest of six children. She was beautiful and she was caring and uh, she loved her family and her family loved her. 
Ruth's family says she wanted to explore life outside of Whitwell. So at the age of 19, she left town and headed to Michigan in search of a brighter future. She was free spirit. She was looking for something more than just a country life, I guess you'd say. In the late 50s, Ruth left Whitwell to work at an automotive plant in Michigan and gave birth to Richard. He was raised by Ruth's friends who could provide him a stable life. After his parents died, Richard began searching for his biological family and took a DNA test through Ancestry.com in 2018 that eventually connected him with the Terry family, only to learn his mom vanished and was missing. I'm 64 years old. I didn't think I'd ever figure anything out, actually. And then, then to find out that she was lost. Ruth's family never knew their lifelong search would end hundreds of miles away in that small cemetery on Cape Cod. It was in October of 2022 when the DNA from Ruth's skull, DNA from Richard and other members of the Terry family led the FBI and the Massachusetts State Police to the Terry family tree and Ruth's roots in Tennessee. That tombstone for so many years just said uh, Lady of the Dunes, and to finally put Ruth Murray's name on it, I think is, is huge for all of us. At first I thought, oh, she's alive, you know, and then I so, so, you know, quick found out that no, that was not the case. The name of Guy Moldavin was learned through family members. Ruth married a man named Guy Moldavin in Nevada using an alias months before she died. The couple lived in California. Maldavin, who also went by the name of Raul Rockwell and several other names, had ties to Provincetown. Barnstable County records show his parents bought land and properties there in the late 40s and mid 50s. What do we know about him? He seemed to be like a womanizer and often had different wives and would marry them for a short time and then divorce them. Ruth likely didn't know about Moldavin's dark past that came to light in hundreds of pages of police reports. The one-time antique dealer had a reputation of being odd and a fraud. He was also eyed as a suspect in two murders, one in California in 1950, another in Seattle, Washington, 10 years later. Moldavin fled Seattle in 1960 after his then wife, Manzanita Mearns, and 18-year-old stepdaughter Dolores were reported missing. He claims Manzanita abandoned him. He filed for divorce and went on to marry another woman soon after, swindling her family out of thousands. But evidence of a brutal killing and mutilation began to surface in the Moldavin Seattle home. Blood seeped into the floorboards and human remains were found in the septic tank. They did a search warrant on the septic tank as well as inside the residence. And inside the septic tank, they found human remains, different weapons inside the house, blood inside the house, and teeth inside. There were two legs that were recovered on the Columbia River and they were able to match at least the blood type. The search for the suspected murderer stretched across the country and the world, with Seattle police sending out this special bulletin describing Moldavin as a man who acts like a socialite and art expert. Ads were taken out in magazines asking for the public's help. Police reached out to law enforcement from Spain to Canada and antiques auctioneers in England. At one point, they even contact Provincetown police looking for information because of his ties there. Word of the Seattle murders piqued the interest of a California sheriff who said Muldavin was also a suspect in the murder of a young man and the disappearance of the man's girlfriend in Eureka back in 1950. People who knew Muldavin told investigators he was an oddball, a pathological liar, who left home in his late teens and falsely paraded around as a war hero. Muldavin was finally tracked down in New York by the FBI in December of 1960, but police didn't have enough evidence in the Seattle murders to prosecute. He was convicted of grand larceny, served time, and ultimately set free. And had he been held accountable in that case in Seattle. It was possible that she could still be here if, if they had have, uh, put him away then. Ruth and Guy Maldavin came home to Tennessee in 1974 to visit family just months before Ruth disappeared. 
Her family says Moldavan returned later that summer and told them Ruth was missing. That's the first time we knew that she was missing. He was so blunt and just said he, he didn't know where she was and all like that, but he didn't stay very long. One of the family members traveled out to California and confronted Guy regarding her whereabouts, and he said that they had gotten into an argument and that she got out of the car, and that that was the last he had ever seen of her. We didn't know him, you know, and we just wondered, why is she with somebody like that, you know? But uh, she was trying to find her way, I guess. She thought she could find a better life away from Whitwell. I would say evil, a con man, charming, charismatic personality. And unfortunately, I think that's what caused several people to lose their lives. What do you think the motivation is? I would say evil. He just seems like he was an evil human being. I'm Julia Cowley. I'm a retired FBI agent and profiler. My biggest case was the Golden State Killer. Retired FBI profiler Julia Cowley has analyzed some of the most horrific cases involving serial killers in the country. She digs into the mind of Maldavin by deciphering the bizarre words and drawings he penned in his twisted book, Cooking with Rump Oil. An important thing to killers is the moment when they can see that the life is going out of somebody's eyes. This really does remind me of that. One of his so-called recipes in the book, titled Cape Cod Shid, has eerie similarities to Ruth Terry's murder. Knowing what we know about the victim and what happened to her and where it happened, I think that we could assume that this is what he's referring to, but he's, it's a disguise. The way he's drawn the hair here, and, and I know she had you know, flowing um, auburn hair, and so that was something that was significant to him. What I do wonder, especially the last, the tender look will become one of despair. You have to think that perhaps that was the moment where he watched the life go out of her eyes when she realized he's going to kill me, and it's horrifying. Cowley says Maldavin's writings could be haunting reflections of his crimes. Writing this book sort of indicates to me that the dismembering was an important aspect to him. There's an underlying disturbing quality, you know, these sort of kind of animals slash human characters that are, it's a little bit creepy and morbid when you go through it and you kind of see what's happening and they're being boiled and filleted and grinded up. I think possibly this was his way of reliving what he had done. But when somebody no longer suits this purpose in his life, he's going to figure out how to change that. That might include, well, I'm done with you. I'm going to kill you. I've wanted to look at this book so, so bad. The tender look will become one of despair. This is what really bothers me is this picture. Because she had she long, had beautiful hair. hair. It's almost like she's looking back at him. The fact that he touched my ma kills me. But the fact that he got away with it pisses me off more than anything. In a way, he wanted attention. He wanted to put this out there into the world. But he also probably is enjoying the fact that nobody really knows his secret. Hints of murder and cannibalism, written by the killer himself, revealed decades later. It's too bad Guy Moldavid didn't have the FBI knocking on his door, but there's plenty of other killers out there that it's just a matter of time before, you know what, we finally found you. I think anybody that's worked on this case had some comfort when we learned of Ruth's name and then we're able to close this case and confidently say that Guy Moldavin was responsible for it. I went out to the grave and stopped and tapped on his gravestone and, and said, you know, we did it. He would be thrilled knowing that after everybody put in that effort that finally it got solved and I just, I could see the smile on his face. It was really an amazing feeling to, to close a case that was nearly 50 years old. 
Did you ever think in your lifetime that you would know? I really didn't. I really didn't. I thought that I would make my exit and no one would still know what ever happened to that poor woman. I'm grateful that there are people that still are relentless and they don't give up. And so now with her known, what will happen to that grave? Will you still go to that grave? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And just say a prayer for her. Amen. Ruth Marie Terry, born 9836, passed 72674, found and loved by angels. I want to go out there and be where she was. I want her to know that it's okay to go. And then, you know, my mom's going to be able to go to heaven. After decades of the unknown, Ruth's family makes the trek across country and down the sandy trail in Provincetown where her life came to a violent end. Getting really anxious, getting really hot. Oh, it's up to the left here, isn't it? What a horrible thing, you know what I mean? In a beautiful place like this, it's just messed up. I can feel, you know, something really bad happened here. And, uh, I don't want to be here at all. Then they gather around that once unmarked grave to say a final goodbye. Grant that our sister Ruth may sleep here in peace until you awaken her to glory. It uh, broke my heart. I came to Provincetown for a, a couple of different reasons. The main one was to bury my mom. The next one was to say thank you to all the people involved. I just want to thank you all for everything you did. The unsolved murder that has had a grip on this community comes full circle at Ruth's final resting place. Her family, investigators, and the families of people bonded by that day back in 1974 visit the graves of police chief Jim Meads. God bless him. And Leslie Metcalf, the 12-year-old girl who discovered Ruth's body. She felt a real connection to Ruth. Now they know where she is. They've been to this town. They've seen the people who, you know, who've been supporting her and who've been caring about her all these years. Time to go, Ma. And when some of Ruth's ashes are tossed into the wind from a hill not far from where she took her final breath, Ruth Marie Terry and her son are finally set free. Oh, God, honey. <laughs> oh. She's free. Oh, God. We can go home. Felt like she'd been waiting a long time for me to come here. I just felt so at peace. Like I completed my task. From the tip of Cape Cod back to the small mining town in Tennessee, a woman who was lost for 48 years is brought home. Yeah, we should put it right here, man. Resting in a peaceful spot by her mother's side in the shadow of the mountains where her life began. Is there any peace for you? Yeah. Yeah, there is actually. Um, it's the fact that we found her, and she's not missing anymore. I just wish I could have met her just once. <laughs>